Thank you very much for coming. And um, yes, so I'm going to talk about the return of the otter to the northeast um, and how we've um, tracked at least a part of that um, return. So I'm going to be talking about, about otters, a bit of uh, their ecology, behaviour, um, why we monitor them, how we monitor them, uh, what we've found in our surveys to date, and what we're going to be doing next. So, to start with otter ecology, history and status in the UK. First of all, though, um, how do we know what an otter looks like and how would we identify one if we saw it? Well, they're quite large animals. Um, a large male is pretty big from head to toe, uh, much big, about um, twice the size at least of a mink um, and a third, probably a third the size, uh, bigger than a polecat, although you won't be seeing too many polecats in the northeast these days but they are coming back a bit. So would you recognise one if you saw one? So here's an otter, sat sitting very posing nicely outside the water. And the animal that you're most likely to see in a similar situation that you might confuse it with is an American mink, also posing nicely outside the water. So you might think, oh, well, that's going to be fairly simple. I wouldn't have any trouble differentiating between them. Unfortunately, you're unlikely to see them in that kind of situation. You're more likely to see that for about two seconds, <laughs> if that, um, which is obviously a bit more challenging. Um, the otter does tend to sit lower in the water, although it, that picture doesn't really show that. Uh, mink aren't quite as good swimmers, so they tend to sit a bit higher in the water. Um, otters are much sleeker. They have a tapered tail. Um, mink are much fluffier and they have a tail which is the same width all the way along. Um, uh, mink also have a pointed nose and otters have this snub nose. So that's how you tell the difference when they're in the water, but if you see them long enough to be able to do that. But we do here have a little comparison video from the same camera trap um, and the first one on the, on the left so this is an otter, and you can see the tapered tail there as it jumped off, and here now we have a mink. So you can see the difference in size, and you can see the fluffy tail uh, and the pointed nose. Do you want to see that again? You can go back and see it, show it again. Right, okay. Right, so here's the otter. Definitely see the tapered tail there quite well. And here's the mink. You can see that pointed nose and the fluffy tail uh, on that quite well. So, having identified an otter, should we find out a little bit about them? So, otters are members of the mustelid family, which also includes weasels, stoats, pine martins and badgers. Um, and we only have one species of otter in the UK, which is the Eurasian otter, Lutra Lutra. Um, if you know anybody who's come back from Scotland to tell you that they've seen sea otters, sorry. <laughs> sea otters are a Pacific species. We don't have them in the UK. They're much, much bigger than our otters. Um, the otters on the coast in Scotland are just otters that have adapted 
to um, uh, forage and to live around the coast. They still need fresh water to clean their fur so that it maintains its thermoregulatory properties. Um, so yes, yeah, same species, just slightly adapted to a different environment. But the Eurasian otter is one of 13 species of otter worldwide, and it's the most widely distributed. Um, you can see here it's a, got a huge range um, all the way across Europe, um, across Asia, um, even into North Africa. So, yeah, so it is definitely uh, very widely distributed. It's also superbly adapted for the semi-aquatic environment in which it lives. Um, it has two layers of fur. It has an undercoat of fur and then an overcoat as well. Overcoat, yeah. Uh, the mean density of, um, of hairs is 70,000 per square centimetre. Now, that's a number which obviously on its own doesn't mean a great deal, but if I tell you that a domestic cat has a, a, a around 20,000 hairs per square centimetre, you can see how much denser the, uh, the hair is on an otter. And that really gives them fantastic thermoregulatory properties and allows them to be active in cold waters all the year round. Um, they're sexually dimorphic, which means that the uh, sexes look slightly different. The males are about, well, can be up to about 50% larger than the females. And they've been widely studied over decades, but we still actually know remarkably little about their ecology um, for reasons which will become apparent. And in the UK, they have been down for decades and centuries. They've been both revered and persecuted. So, life history. Um, Births, um, the females can give birth at pretty much any time of year um, in the UK, definitely in England and Wales, although there are some suggestions that it may be slightly more seasonable in northern Scotland, probably just down due, due to the climate and conditions. Uh, gestation period, 63 to 65 days, and the females will give birth to between two and three cubs every 12 to 15 months. And the cubs stay with their mother, um, until they're around 13 months of old, and she teach, 13 months old, and she teaches them everything. She teaches them how to swim, how to hunt, uh, where to look for food uh, in their territories, uh, everything that they need to know to be able to live an independent life as an otter. The males play no part in the raising of the cubs. Um, the males and females only come together to mate. The males then go off and do their own thing, and the females do all the um, looking after the cubs and raising them. Um, life expectancy, according to um, the literature, is the median age is about three, but obviously, mathematically, that doesn't really help us a great deal, because if the cubs don't leave their mother until they're about 13 months old, and she doesn't give birth until she's about two, then there wouldn't be any otters. Um, so, the there is a, a, a bias in the data on, uh, on that, because the majority of data we have on um, how long otters live comes from um, uh, roadkill otters that uh, are examined. And the majority of roadkill ot otters tend to be juveniles who are dispersing. So there is a skew in the data there as to um, um, the age that otters live. In actual fact, a male otter probably lives to about four or five years old if he's lucky, possibly six, a female six or seven. Uh, but mortality rate is very high. In, as it is for all large carnivores. Uh, the population density is extremely variable and is dependent on um, food availability and conditions in the air in any particular area. So they are solitary, as I say, um, the males and the females don't live in family groups. Some species of otter, you get very large family groups, such as smooth-coated otters and uh, giant otters, they live in large family groups. Um, the Eurasian otter, the females and the cubs are together, but not the males. So um, once, the once the cubs have left the female, she will be on her own until she gives birth again. They're very territorial and they defend very large territories. Um, a male's territory can extend up to 40 kilometres of watercourse, uh, a female's up to 20 kilometres of watercourse. And that will depend on food resources, obviously, um, in the uplands, territories will be much larger because food is uh, scarcer. Um, in places like the Tyne and the Weir, territories are likely to be smaller because there's more food available. Um, they defend their territories against other otters, 
and they mark their territories using spraint, which is what we call otter poo. Um, otters are the only species whose poo we call spraint. Um, and other secretions as well, which I will um, give you illustrations of shortly. So they're semi-aquatic, so they do do most of their hunting in water, but they have their halts on land. They do travel across land as well. Um, and so, yeah, they are semi-aquatic rather than fully aquatic. They can be active at any time of day. Um, most of um, the literature that dates from uh, historically suggested that they were strictly nocturnal, or pretty much strictly nocturnal. But in recent years, they have definitely started to be seen much more often in the daytime. So it's likely that um, that nocturnal behaviour was driven by um, avoidance of humans because they were being persecuted. Um, they have uh, limited vocalisations. Um, the main vocalisations tend to be between females and their cubs or cubs between each other. And I've just got a little um, illustration of what an otter sounds like when it's tweeting. Can you hear that? So if you're walking along the riverbank and you hear that, you might well think you're just hearing a bird, but it could well be an otter. So <laughs> you hear that little chirping, it's worth having a look around to see if there might be an otter around. So their feeding habits, um, they feed mostly on fish. Um, but they also eat uh, amphibians, crustaceans, small mammals, and birds, um, and even some invertebrates. Um, their diet tends to be um, about 70% fish, um, and the others make up smaller proportions. But they are opportunistic predators, so they will um, take whatever uh, happens to be around at the time. But fish is the main component of their diet. So, as I said, um, they have been both revered and persecuted in the, in the history in this country. Um, the Celts thought they were a magical species. Um, they were strong protectors and helped with the gaining of wisdom. And St Cuthbert is the patron saint of otters. And there's lots of iconography of um, uh, St Cuthbert with otters frolicking around his feet, as you can see here. So, yes, they're definitely, um, uh, at that time, were a welcome species. However, by the 12th century, um, they were being hunted by, with hounds. Uh, and by the end of the 19th century, there were about 25 otter hunts in England. And the Northern Counties Otter Hounds, which were formed in 1903, hunted from the north of Yorkshire all the way up to the north of Northumberland. So why do we need to monitor them? Well... Uh, they went into severe decline in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, so the middle of the 20th century. Um, really severe decline. And ironically, it was um, the otter hunts who raised the alarm about this because they suddenly started to report that they were no longer being able to find otters. The reasons for that decline were mainly um, organochlorin uh, pesticides such as dieldrin, which uh, biomagnify up the food chain, um, industrial pollution, uh, especially in northeast England, um, our main rivers here, the Tyne, the Weir and the Tees, were basically dead rivers um, for much of the uh, 20th century due to industrial pollution. And if you've got no fish, you're not going to have any predators. Habitat loss, uh, we, um, the canalisation of um, many of our watercourses make it very difficult for otters to be able to uh, find halt sites where they can rest up. Uh, they can't get out if you've got steep concrete or brick sides to rivers. Uh, and if the river's in flood and they get swept along, they can easily drown. So despite being good swimmers, they do quite often drown. And persecution. It wasn't just uh, the otter hunts that uh, were hunting them. Uh, gamekeepers um, routinely would uh, kill any otter they found because they, perceived, they were perceived to be uh, competition for fish stocks. So they, they were really um, yeah, badly persecuted. So once that um, um, alarm had been raised, um, the Nature Conservancy Council, as it was in those days, um, conducted the first uh, otter survey of England between 1977 and 79. 
and they surveyed nearly 3,000 sites across England during that time, and only 170, which was less than 6% of those sites, showed evidence of otters. Uh, it was slightly higher in the Northumbria region, 8.3%. But that was pretty catastrophic, <coughs> that um, uh, there were so few uh, positive sites. So the only remaining significant um, populations were on the Welsh border and in the southwest. Everywhere else, they were pretty much gone. There were a few fragmented populations in East Anglia and the northern uplands, but yeah, they were in big trouble. So once that had been established, um, steps were started to be made to aid their recovery, and hopefully aid their recovery. Um, so they became a protected species under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. And then by 1982, all agricultural use of uh, dieldrin, aldrin and DDT had been banned. And, of course, there was a major decline in heavy industry, coincidentally, as it happened. Um, Margaret Thatcher killed off all the heavy industry, so perhaps we should think of her as the saviour of the otter. <laughs> not, I'm not sure that would be a claim to fame that she would uh, particularly be interested in. <laughs> um, so, subsequent surveys of England were carried out um, in, in the decades that followed this, so in the 1980s, the 90s, the noughties, and again, um, 2009 to 2010. And it did show a slow, natural spatial recovery across England and Wales since the 1980s. So all those things that had happened did um, uh, actually help. Reintroduction wasn't a major factor in that recovery. There was less than 120 captive bred animals that were released. Uh, into the wild between 1983 and 1999. Most of those were in the uh, Thames region and East Anglia. Um, there were a few uh, rehabilitated otters also released, but captive bred ones is very few. However, um, a recent um, study published actually just this year has shown that the genetic recovery is still, not, is still incomplete. There's still very much um, uh, genetic uh, pockets of all the populations are still very separate. There hasn't been a lot of mixing um, amongst the populations. So it's still, they're still not there yet. Carrying capacity, obviously, um, we don't know whether they're at carrying, capa carrying capacity because we don't have any data as to what that capacity was from pre uh, the decline. Um, of course, this there wasn't a means of uh, establishing that at that time. So we don't know whether they're at carrying capacity or whether we could still have more. Um, there's been a few studies that have tried to um, determine what the, dense, what the best density is of otters um, in England. Um, in 1995, a study found that there was one adult per 27 linear kilometres of river. There was a small DNA study of um, from the Tyne, from a master's uh, project um, which found 0.22 otters per kilometre on the Tyne. Um, a study in Austria estimated between 0.16 and 0.28 otters per kilometre. And in Scotland, in a supposedly high-density area, there was one otter per 24 kilometres. So it's very variable, and yeah, we don't know what uh, our rivers can actually support. So by 2010, um, the National Survey of England that took place in 2009-2010, um, the number of positive sites across England had increased to nearly 60%. Uh, and in Northumbria region, it was up to nearly 80%. So, yeah, so that was a huge improvement in the space of about 30 years. Um, the Biodiversity Action Plan target for 2015 had been exceeded by that point and there'd been a major range, range expansion in the headwaters of the Tees. And you can see here how the change in, um, change in uh, positive sites had uh, improved, improved over those surveys, and that's uh, the red circle there shows the Northumbria region, how it had gone up over those surveys. But... Um, this year, um, a new paper was published. They did a new survey of um, Wales. And Wales had followed a similar recovery pattern that we'd seen in England. You can see here that in uh, 2002, 
uh, the dark green areas were where it was the highest number of positive sites. It was very low in 2002. By 2010, it had increased hugely. But then, between uh, in the, in the latest survey between 2015 and 2018, it had gone down again. Now, nobody really knows why. Uh, they're still trying to determine what the causes of this uh, decline might be and whether it's something which is ongoing or whether it's just a blip. Um, but yes, it's slightly concerning because obviously things aren't all going in one direction. So at the moment, there is a, a sixth National Otter Survey of England taking place, which is being conducted by uh, the Environment Agency, the Mammal Society and Natural England. Um, and that's taking place um, right way through until spring next year. So it'll be very interesting to see what those results are. So why do we monitor? Well, we do have some evidence that the population is still fragile. Carrying capacity, as I said, is unknown. Pollution and persecution are still happening. Um, persecution is certainly at a lower level. Pollution, one would hope, is at a lower level, but yeah, we all know what stories we're getting about the state of our waterways at the moment. And monitoring is an early warning system. Um, otters are an indicator species. Um, they will tell us about the health of our water supply and our water courses. So, surveying and monitoring of otters, how do we do it? Well, the national surveys that the Environment Agency and their precursor um, have carried out tend to be, um, take place over an extended period of up to three years, and they rely on, on indirect signs of presence or absence which is usually um, uh, sprained, etc. Direct counting, of, obviously, of otters isn't possible because they don't have individual markings which would enable you to um, identify an individual otter, except, well, their bibs, to be fair, do have um, individual uh, characteristics, but you would have to be able to see them like that every time to be able to identify one, which is obviously not going to happen because they tend to be active dawn, dusk, and at night, sometimes during the day. And they're fairly secretive, um, and they're very wide-ranging. So um, not possible to, to directly count. So there are limitations of presence-absence surveys. They do, obviously, only do what they say on the tin. Their otters are either there or not there at the time of the survey. You don't get any indication of that from um, population density or of abundance or of the number of, a number of uh, active territories. So alternative methods um, are tagging, um, which you can do, but which is invasive. You have to uh, catch the otter to tag it, sedate it, tag it, and then release it again, and then you have to catch it again to be able to uh, take the tag off. So it's also very expensive, time-consuming. Remote capture cameras, again expensive because you have to buy a lot of cameras um, uh, to be able to uh, survey any kind of uh, area which is big enough. And because of the um, environment in which otters live, um, you'd have to put them by rivers and rivers tend to flood and camera traps don't like water. So <laughs> um, once they get submerged, they tend not to work too well. Um, DNA sampling and genotyping of sprained samples is another possible uh, way of doing it, but um, it's very difficult to um, extract anything other than species and sex data from sprained samples. That sprained samples have to be very fresh. Um, success rate for um, getting um, DNA of individual uh, uh, identification is about 20%. So it's difficult and it's expensive as well. Um, and then there's snapshot surveys, which are an alternative way of doing presence-absence surveys. So they're not perfect either, but they can be done by volunteers, and they're relatively inexpensive, but they are labour-intensive. So um, the snapshot survey um, method that we've been using um, in the Otter Network was developed by the Somerset Otter Group in the 1990s uh, by James Williams. And uh, with this method, he tracked the return of otters to Somerset's rivers, 
and it provided valuable data for monitoring the overall status of the population. And it was also taken up by the Dorset Mammal Group in 2012. So that brings us to the northeast annual spring otter survey, um, which is a snapshot survey following that same method. Um, I instigated the survey in, first in 2013 when I was the otter project officer for Durham Wildlife Trust. And we trained up um, over 100 volunteer surveyors. Um, and um, they have been, most of those have continued to take part and we have uh, got more and more volunteers over the years. And this year we ran our 10th survey. So we've been going, doing it for 10 years now and we've now trained well over 200 volunteers. So the methodology that we use, so each volunteer surveyor is allocated a patch of watercourse um, which is usually in their area where they live or somewhere that they walk regularly. Um, and in that patch of watercourse, they select specific sites to check um, uh, for otter signs, and they get the grid references or what three words or whatever for that, that site. And they check those sites. Um, so the survey takes place over one weekend um, in, during the year, in the spring, and... The same sites are checked on both the Saturday and the Sunday morning. And any signs that are found on the second day that weren't there on the first day tell us that an otter was there on the Saturday night. So we're effectively freezing the activity of the otters on one night of the year. And that gives us data which enables us to estimate the number of active otter territories within the survey area. So it's not allowing us to count the number of otters, but it is allowing us to estimate the number of active otter territories. Minimum number, anyway. So um, every year we run training sessions um, so that new volunteers um, can know what to look for. Um, and uh, previous volunteers can also get refreshers <coughs> as well. So, and this is what a survey patch looks like. So the hatched area here is um, a patch uh, of watercourse. Um, and the stars, red stars on there, are the sites within that patch that that surveyor has chosen to uh, look for uh, otter signs. So there's usually about six um, sites within a patch. And then on the survey weekend, as I say, um, the surveyors go out to their patch on the sa Saturday morning and they record everything that they find. And then they go out again on the Sunday morning uh, and record anything that was not there on the Saturday. And what they're looking for is spray generally and other excretions um, that otters might leave. As I say, otters mark their territories using their spray or poo. Um, and fortunately for us, because they're mark using it as a territorial marker, they tend to leave their spray in places that are relatively easy for us to find too. Um, so they tend to leave it on rocks um, and tree uh, stumps and places where you can quite easily find it. So otter spray uh, is fairly distinctive. Um, it tends to be um, sort of black, um, unless the otters have been eating crayfish, in which case it can be a bit quite red. It will have bits of shell or um, fish scales in it, other bones, um, and it's quite loosely bound and it has a very distinctive smell. It smells fishy or musky. Um, some people say it smells like jasmine tea. <laughs> Can't say I've ever got that, but anyway. <laughs> um, uh, but it is a very distinctive smell. It's not unpleasant. Um, it's, uh, nothing else smells like otter springs. And if you, once you get the um, smell of it uh, to recognise it, then you can quite often just be walking along the river and you can smell it, and you think, oh, God, there's definitely an otter around here. They also leave um, uh, these tarry smears. Um, confusingly, mink will also leave their scat in similar places to where otters leave their spring. But mink scat does look very different. It's much, you can see here there's um, an otter spring on the top there and a mink scat underneath. And... The mink scat tends to be much more tightly bound and it has a point at the end and it smells yuck. <laughs> um, so that makes it much, a little bit more um, 
easy to uh, identify between the two, differentiate between the two. Uh, otters also leave this uh, anal jelly, but that is more difficult to find because it tends to get washed away and it's also clear, so um, it's more difficult to find that. We also look for tracks. So otters being, mem being mustelids, uh, they have five toes on both, uh, both front and rear feet, uh, whereas dogs have four, obviously. Um, mink also, being in the same family, also mustelids, they also have five toes. Uh, but you can see here the difference between otter tracks, which are much more rounded, elongated, and they have these teardrop-shaped toes, whereas mink are much smaller, about the size of a two-pence piece, are much more star-shaped. Uh, their toes in the tracks look much more pointed. Um, so, yeah, uh, otters are much more rounded-looking uh, track. Feeding remains also uh, are a good sign that something has been there, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean it was an otter. Because even if you find a half-eaten fish, it could have been something else that left it but what it can tell you is that it might be worth looking around to see whether there's some sprint or tracks there, uh, because there's definitely been something there. <coughs> and as I said, um, because otters are using their sprint and um, uh, other secretions to mark their territories, they tend to leave them in specific places which are um, quite easy to locate, or can be easy to locate. So their favourite places are under bridges, uh, this obviously helps them to uh, mark their territory because the bridge protects the sprain from being washed away. Um, so it means it lasts longer so they don't have to keep going back as, as often uh, to re -sprain. Um Boulders in the middle of uh, the stream. Watercourse junctions, quite often good places to look. Uh, it's a weak point in an otter's territory at a junction of watercourses because another otter can come down and um, uh, invade their territory, so they will often sprain at watercourse junctions, uh, gravel banks, fallen trees. Um, and also, um, otters will quite often, if, they're, if, they're, if there's a strong current and they're swimming upstream they, and it's a, get to a bend in the river, they might well take a shortcut across the grass so that they don't have to expend all that energy swimming against the current and that you get a little otter run, you'll find that they use it regularly and you'll get a, a sort of trodden path where they uh, go across there and they will quite often spray to either end of those otter runs. So we also, as part of our data, um, take uh, use supplementary data, so quite a lot of people will put out trail cameras over the survey weekend and if we're very lucky, we might get a nice video like that where we get <laughs> three otters on the Saturday night. So that was definitely a positive um, result for that one. And also when people, um, uh, when people report they've seen otters, um, if they see them actually over the, site, uh, over the survey weekend, that's obviously perfect. But also if we get reports of sightings of otters um, within three days either side of the survey weekend in an area where we haven't got a surveyor, then that will obviously um, uh, allow us to um, add that to our data. So what have we found? Okay, so the results from um, all the years of the survey to date. Um, the survey has been pretty much growing since the start. You'll see this is the number of patches uh, the exception to that, obviously, was 2020, which was severely impacted by uh, the COVID-19 lockdown. We did still manage to do a small survey with people who were able to walk to their patches um, as part of their one-hour outdoor exercise <laughs> per day. Um, but it was, yes, a very, much smaller survey that year, unfortunately. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, um, as I say, the number of patches has generally increased year on year um, and the number of territories that we've found um, or um, inferred um, has remained pretty stable within that area. Um, we did have a slight dip last year. We got back to um, pretty much um, uh, our usual number of volunteers 
but the number of uh, territories which we identified did go down last year. So that, we don't know whether that was just a blip. Um, we will find out next year whether or not that's something that we should be worried about. So, yeah, just to show that's um, the number of adjudicated dotted territories. We did increase, we increased our survey area in 2019. Um, to start with, we only uh, surveyed between the Tyne and the Tees, but in 2019 we went up, um, we now go up as far as um, Ashington and Morpeth. Um, getting much further up there is going to be a bit problematic in terms of managing, <laughs> managing it, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, we'll see how we go. So just a couple of um, maps to show um, the spread of uh, our data. The green polygons here are the survey patches and the uh, red triangles are all the positive sites. So that's all the sites where we found evidence of otters this year. Um, and here we can see all the sites where we found uh, evidence of fresh activity on the Sunday. So this is actually definitely active um, uh, otter territories over the survey weekend. Um, we also um, take in records of sightings. So through our website, um, people can record sightings of otters. So this is all the sightings of otters we've had uh, between 2014, since 2014 up till June this year. It's not up to date. I'm afraid I haven't managed to get uh, around to going, putting uh, all the rest of the sightings. You can see quite easily the courses of the Tees, the Weir, uh, and the Tyne there, and then obviously odd um, sightings elsewhere, but the um, bulk of sightings are all along the major rivers, probably because that's where most people are, to be honest. Um, and also, we um, record and collect where possible um, otters that are killed on the roads and through other reasons and we send the carcasses down to Cardiff University Otter Project um, for post-mortem where they take um, uh, samples of, um, from their livers um, which gives us information on um, pollution levels etc in the water um, and health of the otters and they, can, they take DNA samples as well. So there's quite a lot of dead otters there, I'm afraid. That's also since 2012. So um, we will be doing another survey <laughs> at the end of April next year. Um, it will actually be the, not the final weekend of April, but uh, the one before that, because there's an awful lot of bank holidays around that time next year, <laughs> with Easter, May Day and coronations. <laughs> so I try to avoid bank holiday weekends because people tend to go on holiday. Um, so, yeah, so if anybody's interested in taking part in next year's survey, please get in touch, um, either by email or you, we've got a Facebook group as well, which you can join, um, or you can have a get in touch through the website as well. So anybody who would like to take part, if you live between the um, River Tees and Ashington and Warpath in the north, then please do. We're definitely interested in getting uh, new volunteers, if possible. I'd just like to say thank you to all the uh, volunteers who've given up their time to help us monitor and conserve our otters over the years. Whoops. Thank you very much for listening. And if anybody's got any questions. Thank you.